This is David Beckwith. I'm here today to read to you the first chapter of the second book in the Will and Betsy Black Adventure series called A Calculated Conspiracy. But before I start reading, let me give you a little bit of background on the book. When my wife Nancy and I first came to the Keys, all we saw in the news day after day after day was a company called K-Club, and it looked like K-Club was absolutely trying to take over the Keys and they, they were buying condominiums, they were buying apartments, they were buying restaurants, they even were distilling rum, they were doing vacation rentals. There was nothing that they didn't seem like that, that they were doing. They even bought a piece of property in Marathon and sold it to the school board. But anyway, so we, we started following K-Club, uh, and it had, Nancy and I had spent 40 years in financial services, and I can't tell you how many seminars we have sat through on compliance issues. And we kept looking at this thing and said, there's no free lunches in this world. This thing has got to be a scam. Well, we started collecting articles on it, and next thing you know, we had a major portfolio of articles on this, on this company. And we started writing the book. Well, we finished the book in 2008. Guess what happened? K-Club imploded in the bad economy. They went bankrupt. The next thing we knew, we put the book out, and, and there was an SEC investigation that started and said that this thing was actually a $300 million Ponzi scheme. So anyway, with that in mind, uh, let me start the first chapter of A Calculated Conspiracy. The evening calm was deceiving. A veneer of contentment lay over the perfect tropical night at the Dolphin Marina. Will and Betsy Black had driven from Vero Beach that afternoon with their friends Jimmy and Henry Sue Bynum to spend a relaxing 4th of July in the Keys. Guy and Penny Walsh had taken their car down, trailing their boat down along with the two teenagers, Lexi and Laura, and the group had reconvened at the Dolphin Marina on Little Torch Key. The trip had been planned since last Christmas, which the Walshes and the Blacks had spent together. All anticipated a marvelous holiday weekend. After dinner, Will, Guy, and Jimmy pulled some of the marina's rosin chairs near the waterfront to enjoy the cool early evening air. Guy and Jimmy each lit up a cigar to go with the remainder of a bottle of Chardonnay that they had brought downstairs after dinner. Lexi and Laura disappeared, deciding to, to explore the dock so they could see if they could spot some fish. Conversation continued in a low-key, easy-going manner as they watched the shimmer of the water reflecting the light of the moon. Each was completely relaxed as Key's disease took hold. In the background, they could hear the bass notes of music coming from the Gulf side. I see there's a rock band playing over the boondocks, Guy said, referring to the tiki bar. They'll be going till the wee hours. I understand Mile Marker 24 is playing. If that's who it is, the place will be packed, Will said. Howard's developed one hell of a following down here. He'll also be on Lord Sugarloaf tomorrow night for the fireworks celebration. I was playing one of his discs in the boom box a little while ago upstairs. It always seems strange how far sound will carry over water. That music is coming all the way from Ramrod, Guy said. Sound like everyone's having a good time, but I'd rather be right here kicking back and making drinks out of my own whiskey. It'll be fun listening to them in person, though, tomorrow night. As soon as I get up the energy, I'm going upstairs to get a refill. Anybody need anything while I'm up there, Will asked. Guy looked at the sky and took a lazy drag on his cigar. There wasn't a cloud anywhere. He exhaled a big puff from his cigar. I'm good right now. Damn, this is relaxing. The stars are always so clear down here. They just seem to pop out of the sky. I could get used to this. I already have, Jimmy agreed. It would take a stick of dynamite to jar me out of this chair. Suddenly, their tranquility was broken by the sound of an outboard motor pulling up to the far end of the marina. Almost before they could turn their heads to look, the boat quickly emptied. There appeared to be 15 and 20 Cuban refugees who instantly took off across the pea rock that covered the parking lot. Will panicked until he saw Lexi and Laura were safe at the other end of the dock. The high-powered boat slammed into reverse, turned, and immediately took off from the protected harbor back to open water. 
They could hear the motor jump into full throttle and quickly disappear into the night. The pilot never looked back as the cargo of passengers scattered in all directions. A woman with a young boy holding on to her hand tripped over a rock in the grassy area near the parking lot. Will and Guy and Jimmy all ran to a sister since most of the other Cuban immigrants had vanished into the dark. Betsy Penny and Henry Sue witnessed the landing from the porch of Hibiscus One. The woman was shaken but not hurt. Gracias was all she said. Betsy dialed 911 on her cell phone. Penny said that he had read that the illegal aliens coming via the sea were instructed to find locals who could help them call immigration officials for processing. The current law initiated by the Clinton administration is known as wet foot, dry foot policy. Simply foot, Cubans who reach land before being caught by the Coast Guard, the Navy, the DEA, or the Border Patrol fell under the dry foot portion of the law, which meant that they could remain in the United States. Those less fortunate who were interdicted at sea were rounded up and returned to Cuba. Betsy added, There have been many explanations as to why people take such huge risks to come to America. Many describe the Castro regime's failed political, economic, and social policies. Others have said life in Cuba has simply become too unbearable to deal with. Some of it blame on the U.S. imposed travel restrictions. The discussions on the topic are almost about as endless as smuggling traffic from Cuba. Then they all was quiet again except for the thumping bass of the band coming from Ramrod Key.